Hey guys, this is day two of the night. And what we're talking about here is the advent of the talking motion picture, adding sound. This is really, really, really going to lead to the golden age of Hollywood, the great big Hollywood sign and stars magazines. These are some of the stars leading up to the um, uh, sound and in, in, in motion pictures. Of course, Charlie Chaplin, uh, Rudolph Valentino. We've talked about him before. He was like a heartthrob and uh, had fan clubs when he was killed in a car accident. There were women who actually said they could not live without him and committed suicide. You have Greta Garbo. She was a uh, foreign and she... Uh, was considered very, very sexy, and then Mary Pickford, kind of the girl next. This is going to be the very first um, major motion picture with sound, and it was called The Jazz Singer, starring Al Jolson. And the um, big song was a song called Mammy. Now, he did do this in blackface. It was part of the uh, the movie where he goes to Broadway and he performs in blackface and this is Mammy. that's his mother Mammy. the sunshine feet the sunshine sweat but I know where the sunshine best So that was the very first song that people heard in the theaters and um, got better from there. Even though things were going very, very well in the United States, still two-thirds of the people were considered poor. Uh, the one-third that are poor were working in lower-income jobs, you know, factories and so forth. The one-third that were very poor included your farmers and new immigrants into the country. And then one-third of the people were doing pretty well. Uh, we were have a growing middle class and uh, all the way up to rich. So we did enjoy the best standard of living in the world in the United States during this The farmers were in trouble because of overproduction. Uh, they had produced so much and they'd had new farm equipment uh, during World War One, that when the war was over, they just had too much. And if you have too much of something, the price goes down. And so the farmers, farmers were in trouble. Uh, this is technology in the 20s. And, uh, Without the automobile, the prosperity of the 20s would have been impossible. Within a generation, the dream of owning a car became a reality for two out of three families. On crowded city streets, the sound of horses' hooves had been replaced by horns and the smells of oil and gasoline. Detroit became a modern mecca, and people came from all over the world to tour the Ford plant and see how cars were made. 
Henry Ford had revolutionized the industry in 1914 with a moving assembly line that cut Model T production time from 14 hours to 93 minutes. By 1925, a Model T rolled off the line every 10 seconds. Scientific management, new technology, and advertising, our tour guide pointed out, have made the automobile industry the greatest achievement of our time. We were impressed. Nearly 30 million cars crowded the country's roads by the end of the decade. Driving was an adventure, especially beyond the city limits. 98% of our roads were unpaved. Smart drivers always carried chains and a shovel in case they got stuck in the mud. New federal laws provided matching funds to states for road building, and thousands were hired to build them. We spent more money building highways in the 20s than was spent on any other industry. Arizona built a highway across the desert. New York built the Bronx River Parkway and the Holland Tunnel. Massachusetts paved the Mohawk Trail. By 1928, we could drive all the way from New York to Kansas on paved roads. By the end of the decade, we were building 10,000 miles of new roads and spending more than a billion dollars every year. There was other new construction in the decade. We built new dams and hundreds of new hydroelectric plants. The amount of hydroelectric power produced more than doubled in the 20s. Two-thirds of American homes had electricity by 1929. It's also a period of consolidation. Local utilities were swallowed by regional corporations. And by the end of the decade, ten holding companies controlled nearly three-fourths of the nation's electric power. Prices went down as consumption went up. We needed more electricity for millions of new washing machines, toasters, lamps, and vacuum cleaners, radios, and telephones. We laid nearly 50 million miles of new telephone cable in the 20s and installed 10 million new telephones. Telephone linemen worked beneath city streets and in the air on poles that stretched along our new highways all across the country, connecting farms, villages, big cities, and towns. One of the most important technological developments of the 20s was radio. The first radios were called crystal sets, and we listened to the first broadcast through earphones. Thousands were sold, and we took them everywhere. Radio quickly became big business. By 1923, an 8-tube RCA with five dials and a speaker cost $275. GE sold 11 million sets that year. There were other new developments. Dr. Francis Jenkins, a radio engineer and inventor living in Washington, D.C., conducted successful experiments in wireless transmission of pictures, which led to the first television broadcast in 1927. Station WGY in Schenectady began scheduled broadcasts in 1928. The television remained a curiosity for most of us in the 20s. More practical applications of technology, like refrigerated trucks and railroad cars, meant better diets for many Americans. Milk could be kept cold and shipped from farm to doorstep in a few hours. By 1926, milk production had increased by a third as we equated more milk with better health. By 1926, milk production had increased by a third. The homemaker of the 20s was concerned with good nutrition and her family's health. Many children were among the half million Americans who died in the flu epidemic of 1918, and proper nutrition meant resistance to disease. Electric refrigerators provided the biggest changes in our kitchens. Refrigerators and a better knowledge of what made a balanced diet. With electric refrigerators, we could keep fresh foods longer at stable temperatures. And this meant more Americans ate meat and milk. 
fresh fruits and vegetables than ever before. While most families depended on an ice box and regular delivery of ice to keep food cold, nearly a million families bought electric refrigerators in the 20s. By the end of the decade, you could buy one for less than $300. Nearly a million families bought electric refrigerators in the 20s. In 1920, a first-class letter cost two cents. For some Americans, faster communication was important. A Chicago businessman could call his stockbroker in New York long distance for three dollars. But when most of us had news to share, we used the mail. Air mail and transcontinental delivery became regular services of the post office in 1924. By 1927, even Railway Express was shipping parcels by air. The government contracted with private airlines to carry the mail. For many young men, flying the mail was a great adventure. Lindbergh began his career as an air mail pilot. At that time, landing fields were scarce and air lanes poorly marked. Commerce Secretary Herbert Hoover led the campaign in the 20s for the development of municipal airports and began building airways with radios, beacon lights, emergency landing fields, and weather services. But flying the mail was still a risky business. Almost everybody in the 20s was fascinated with flight. And during the decade, a lot of us got our first chance to fly. Ten million Americans attended air shows and paid barnstorming pilots five dollars for a five-minute flight. Lindbergh's flight to Paris convinced many that air transportation was practical. By the late 20s, there were dozens of small airlines carrying passengers. Pan American World Airways became the first international passenger carrier in 1928. For $50, you could fly Pan Am from Key West to Havana. It had only been 25 years since the Wright brothers had shown that flight was possible. Now, aviation technology was beginning to give us all a new perspective. There were lots of cool new inventions, one of them being Kleenex. Kleenex was the number one brand since 1924. It was actually um, uh, created because of that flu epidemic because people used to use, you know, cloth handkerchiefs. And now you could dispose of these, and Kimberly Clark called them disposable handkerchiefs. Scotch tape. Okay, this is 3M, and uh, it's, it actually started with people uh, wanting to have two-tone cars, and in order to get that good straight line, you needed uh, a, some sort of adhesive. So they came up with this idea of uh, a tape, kind of, uh, it wasn't really scotch tape at this point, transparent, but it's going to develop into that, so uh, people could paint and have a straight line, and they called it scotch, kind of a funny story because they'd put these these pieces of tape on the car and they'd fall off and Scottish people supposedly were known for being very cheap and so the joke was must have been a Scottish guy that made this tape because it didn't put enough adhesive on it and it just kind of stuck get it kind of stuck okay it's bad all right band-aids uh, this is kind of a cute story there's a guy named Earl Dickinson and he uh, married Josephine. He worked for Johnson & Johnson. And uh, Josephine was a horrible cook, horrible in the kitchen. And he would come home at night and she was trying to prepare a meal and there would be blood. And uh, he, he would, oh my goodness, let me, let me get you bandaged up. So he'd take a piece of, of tape and, and fold up gauze and um, put it on her. Well, he got the idea, I'll pre-make these. So he started making pre-made bandages and he told the folks at work about it and they said that's a great idea was born so basically it was invented because he had a klutzy wife the zipper okay so <laughs> sounds like you know everybody buttoned everything up there was a guy named Whitcomb Judson and it was first called the slide fastener and used by the United States Navy uh, on, with rubber boots and jackets and ultimately they said, hey, this, this would be a lot easier uh, front of pants, back of dresses and so forth than buttoning things up. And we have this. He called it the slide fastener. Then one, uh, 
one cold, cold night, a guy named Frank Epperson, they used to have um, powdered uh, fruit stuff that you would mix with water, and he had been stirring that on the back porch. He got distracted. The next morning he comes out, he pulls it out, and he has got a popsicle. Now, he wanted to name it after him, the Epsicle, but um, no, he, they, they talked him out of that. And we have the popsicle. They had the three flavors. And what would you say is the most popular? You would be right if you said grape. Eskimo pie. Okay, this is uh, was originally called the ice cream bar, and whenever you tried to put chocolate on ice cream, it would just kind of fall off. And so um, this fellow, Christian Nelson, he worked at a, a, a kind of they used to have uh, counters in drugstores and stuff, or soda fountains, and he started experimenting with different types of cocoa butter mixed in with the chocolate, and came up with one that would stick, and he. He called it at first the ice cream bar, and then it evolved to the Eskimo pie. So these are some other firsts from the 1920s, um, still around today. Welch's grape jelly, uh, still the favorite flavor of all types of jelly. Rice Krispies, Snap Crackle Pop, Electric Toasters, Wrigley's Chewing Gum, and Frozen Foods. Um, so now people would have freezers, and they could actually get frozen pastries, frozen vegetables, and keep them and, and cook them. So this, you can see the freezers aren't real big, but this is um, a electric refrigerator, refrigerator from the 1920s. And uh, this is going to revolutionize people's health and the way they live, being able to keep food out, because a lot of people that died of food poisoning this is a stove from the 19, uh, 1927. It hasn't changed that much, but if you look on the right-hand side here, you used to be able to cook and then put things on the top if you had something in the oven, and that was like a warming station that would keep your food. Uh, this is showing a, a modern kitchen from 1933. Kind of cute, isn't it? Uh, got the motor of the refrigerator on the top now, which makes it roomier. Um, they've got the stove over here, and you can see everything's kind of color-coordinated. Some of the luxury items, uh, you might have heard the term painted woman. It used to be women had to put everything on with a brush. They had to mix their, their lip uh, powder with a glycerin, and they would paint um, their lips. Now, if you had some money, these were luxury items. You actually had a lipstick, you had pressed powders. And instead of having to pin your timepiece, now you could wear it as a wristwatch. Magazines played a big part in promoting and advertising um, all these products. And one of the ways they got people to buy was they got these really good authors who would write maybe a book, but they would publish a chapter a week. And then people got into the books and just had to buy the next um, issue of the magazine so they could see what happens next. So this is an example of a, a story that was done called Bernice Bob. And this is by F. Scott Fitzgerald, and you might recognize the name from Great Gatsby. And basically he's talking about a woman who, um, in defiance of her family, cuts her hair off, and she is becoming this modern woman. And so he would write uh, a chapter, and people would tune in to see what would happen to Bernice. These are some other um, magazines that came out in the 1920s, Life Magazine. McClure's had been around for a while. They'd done um, some of the uh, muckraking, if you recall. I did terrible work for McClure's for a while. And Leslie's was a uh, fashion magazine. The very first commercial radio station was KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and it is going to broadcast the results of the 1920 election, and by the end of the, uh, well, by just in, just in a matter of a few years, there were 500 radio stations across the country. Um, 12 million people by 1920 had radios. 
And this is what they look like. They were kind of big. They had those big old tubes and, you know, not like the chips that we've got today. And uh, Digga Digga Do was one of the top songs that people listen to um, from the Mills Brothers. And the Mills Brothers actually are still around today. So um, if you get a chance, look up the Mills Brothers and listen to Digga Digga Do. You can see it's much like people gather around a TV, people would gather around the radios. And they, this is the uh, advent of the soap opera, the serials um, that would come on, variety shows, news shows, sports shows, especially boxing. Boxing was a big one that they used to have on the radio. And people, whole families would gather around for their shows. This is what the epitome of what a flapper should look like. This is the, uh, the, hair, the hairstyle, the um, beautiful, beautiful uh, shoulders, scoop neck, the silk stockings, high, the, and the uh, high heels. So this is, this is the age of the flapper, and this, is, this was the look going for. So no more covered from head to toe. Uh, no more of those big old hats and the hair up. A very different look. Uh, women smoked in public for the very first time. They wore makeup. They cut their hair. They called it bobbed. And they wore those uh, high heel pointy shoes. Hem lines were about knee length and uh, this very kind of drapey, silky style. Louise Brooks was. Um, the cover girl and this is you can get a real good idea about what the hair looked like here and she epitomized what a 1920s flapper should look like they wore something called a cloche hat and if you look at the hat it keeps the bangs down keeps that side curl um, just like it's supposed to be so that was the style and look at those big old eyes okay so um, mascara and eyeliner and lipstick and that was the style. This transcended race, so uh, Hispanic, black, white, women, and then uh, this style is actually going to um, go across the seas and they will have the same style. They called it the young boy look, so it's a uh, it's really kind of sexy, but you got that lower waist, you got the high hemline, scoop neck, showing a lot of arm. Men wore suits. Um, some men wore the traditional suits. You can see with the straight legs and lapels, and then there was a jazz suit that had kind of a flair to it, and the wider lapel. But men still wore ties, even on the golf course. Uh, this is this is just kind of a typical wear on the golf course. Know this. This is your first it girl. She had that something. That something that uh, women wanted to look like her, men wanted to possess her. And Clara Bow is known as the first it girl. She had it. So you might think, who was another it girl? Uh, perhaps from the 1950s, Marilyn Monroe, and do we have an it girl today? This is a Miss America contest from 1923 or 24. Um, this was uh, Atlantic City, and you can see this so there. This is a swimsuit competition. Some people thought it was vulgar and disgusting that women would show their knees and their shoulders like that. And a lady named Coco Chanel came out with the idea that every woman should have in her closet a little black dress. 